The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. For viewers of a certain age, Saturday nights belong to this network and an evening of film hosted by the one and only Elwi Yost. Tonight, ahead of the world premiere of the TVO documentary Magic Shadows about his life, we'll revisit the incredible contributions of one of cinema's biggest fans. Then, our Ontario hubs explain why some foreign agricultural workers are making a human rights claim against the OPP. And from the provincial government's overtures for a new relationship with labor to understanding who can claim to be indigenous, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, November 26th, and that's all next on The Agenda. Before you could stream, rent, download, or buy movies to view at your own convenience, people in Ontario relied on movie lover and TVO host Elwi Yost for much of what they got to see or learn about cinema. He presented classics, varied genres, art house flicks, and behind the scenes interviews. It may sound familiar now, but TVO's Saturday night film programming, and particularly Elwi Yost's infectious enthusiasm, well, they were one of a kind. His life and the passion that anchored more than a quarter century of programs on this network is now the subject of a documentary. It's called Magic Shadows, Elwi Yost, A Life in Movies. It has its world premiere, appropriately enough, this Saturday night, 8 p.m., and it brings to our airwaves tonight Elwi's two sons, filmmaker Graham Yost in Los Angeles, California, and writer Christopher Yost in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we couldn't do this without Risa Schumann, who was executive producer of Saturday Night at the Movies. She's joining us from the Bloor West Village area of the provincial capital, and it is so good to see you three again. Do you know, Risa, I want to start with you, and I just don't want to make any assumptions because we have a lot of people watching this program who are new Canadians or who are young Canadians who never saw Saturday Night at the Movies. So let's start from scratch. Who was Elwi? What made him distinct? Okay, Elwi Yost was probably the world's greatest film buff. He lived and breathed movies. And in 1974, a package of documentaries came in to the building from a distributor, and along with it came three Ingmar Bergman films. And Elwi, who had hosted a show on the CBC in the 60s called Passport to Adventure, so he was well known for his love of movies, was asked at, in his corporate world where he was working at TVO, how do we put feature films, especially these three Ingmar Bergman movies, on an educational network. Now, you have to know, we were only about four years old, TVO. So we're going back to the middle TV 1970s right now. Exactly. And it wasn't even TVO. It was Channel 19. We had one station. And they uh, came to Elwi and said, how do we do it? And he said, well, the films are quite spiritual in context. Ingmar Bergman is known for that. So why don't we take these three films, go to three religious congregations, show the film, and film their reaction and their discussion? And that's how it all started. It was take a film and put it into a context. Fabulous. Let's uh, show the man at work, shall we? Here's from the documentary Magic Shadows. If you would, Sheldon, please. That was the 1925 version of The Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney. Make you shudder? I hope so. The Phantom was remade twice since then, once in 1943 with Claude Rains in the role. <clears throat> That's the one I first saw as a kid growing up. And again in 1962 with Herbert Lom. But I still think the first version will always stand out as the most memorable. Graham, the camera just loves him. And he loves the camera, you can tell. Why? He was just such, I mean, Chris and I both know, he was such an, a warm human being in real life, and that really translated um, onto the camera and onto the screen. And that doesn't happen with everyone. You know, you meet people who are wonderful people and you get along with them and they get in front of a camera and there's nothing there. But dad just had that magic. Um, 
And, you know, he, when he was talking about something, as Risa said, you know, he loved movies. I mean, Chris and I grew up just talking about movies from the, the, the from when we were little, little toddlers. And uh, so that passion, I think, came across. Chris, there is a, I don't know if this is a myth or there's certainly a, something in the air that suggests that your father never saw a movie that he didn't like, that he loved everything. Is that true? Yeah, that's a, a, a lovely uh, uh, myth, and it's, it's not true at all. Um, how you could tell that my, my father hated a film, at the end of the film, he would just be in a really, really bad mood. Um, he wouldn't berate any aspect of the film, the acting or anything. He would just be in a really foul mood. After The Exorcist 2, I think he was in a bad mood for about three days. <laughs> and uh, Jaws 2, the same. He didn't like those sequels, so, eh? Yeah, he did. He, if it was bad, it, it deserved to be hated. And he couldn't find something good in it. It would be, yeah, he'd just be really bummed out for quite a while. Well, let's go to the other side of the spectrum then, Graham. What were, uh, obviously, the man saw th uh, tens of thousands of movies in his life. Did he have a handful that were his favorites? He did. He had sort of the, the sentimental handful, like King Kong and Thief of Baghdad. Um, but then he also, you know, his his favorite was was Citizen Kane, um, uh, the Treasure of the Sierra Madre. But like right up into present times. I mean, he well, not our present now, but I mean, Chris took them to see Borat, and my dad thought that was one of the funniest movies he'd ever seen. Um, he loved good comedies. He was not a big fan of musicals. And, uh, you know, one of the family stories was first date with mom takes her to see a musical and they come outside and he said, what did you think? And she said, no, nah, I don't really like musicals that much. Well, what do you like? And she said, you know, things like Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And that was it. You know, then <laughs> they were married for 60 years because of that. Amazing. Risa, I want to pick up on the Citizen Kane comment. Did he ever get a chance to meet Orson Welles, whom I know he held in extremely high regard? Well, the boys may disagree with me on this, but I am happy that he never met Orson Welles. Orson Welles, at the time that we would have interviewed him, was a bit of a laughing stock. He was a bit of a buffoon. He was on Johnny Carson, your favorite show, Steve, uh, all the time, you know, with magic tricks and things. And he really wasn't the Orson Welles of Citizen Kane. The, in one of the first years, he did, they did get an offer. Now, we never paid anyone, but Orson Welles demanded $5,000. And I know that Elwi was going to cash in a life, poli a life insurance policy just to get it. But in the end, it didn't work out. And I think for Elwi, it was the best. You know, when you talk about him not see, seeing a movie he didn't like. I mean, he took it all very personally. And it was like an offense to him that why was this film not so good? It should have been better. It had blah, blah, blah. And so that was part of our mission was to point out that nobody goes in to make a bad movie. People go in with all the best intentions. So what happens? Why does a film come out okay? And why does a film not work? And those were some of the motivations and answers we tried to get for the 25 years that he was there and subsequent years that followed. Let me follow up with Chris on whether you think, Chris, it, it actually in the end proved to be a good thing that he never meant his hero, Orson Welles. I honestly can't answer that. Um, I know that he probably wanted to, and I'm sure that if he had a, had an opportunity to interview Orson, he could have steered the interview in a way that would have worked out at least fairly well. Um, it's hard to say. Graham, what do you say? I, I I think Chris is right on that. You know, there was the we one of the great stories of lore of Saturday Night at the Movies was uh, his interview with Henry Fonda that just didn't go well at first um, until my dad started talking about the paintings he saw um, around the, I think that's in the documentary, around it is, Henry's yes. house, right? And and then he opened up, but it might have been a bad interview. Um, but he was, he was pretty good at getting people to open up because he had done his homework. 
Um, and he clearly wasn't there to criticize or nitpick or draw attention to any, you know, of their personal lives. He was just there to talk about the movies. And and a lot of these people love talking about the movies. So he might have gotten something out of Orson, but you know, you don't know. Uh, Reese is right. At that point in his career, he wasn't the Orson Welles that he was back in Citizen Kane and Ambersons and Touch of Evil and, and all of that. Right. Reese, he didn't uh, interview Orson Welles, but he did interview somebody else from Citizen Kane. How did that go? He did. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, we were interviewing Patricia Medina. We had signed... Um, we had arranged an interview with her. Now, at the time, she was actually Mrs. Joseph Cotton. Now, Joseph Cotton was one of the only living uh, people left from, from uh, Citizen Kane and Ambersons. So um, I was in the lobby to um, await the arrival, and I see two figures in this big caddy drive up. And sure enough, out comes Patricia Medina, and out comes this elegant, you know, beautiful posture, this lovely man, Joseph Cotton. Now, you have to know that Joseph Cotton at this point in his life had had not only a stroke and he learned to speak again, but he then got throat cancer and they he couldn't speak. He could only whisper. Anyway, he came out, he was beautifully dressed, and I got very emotional. And I said, oh my God, my host is gonna be apoplectic. Anyway, we got in the elevator, I took him up. I had this marvelous moment of terrific timing. Elwi came out of the room and I said, Elwi, May I introduce you to Mr. Joseph Cotton? And Elwi immediately burst into tears. Burst into tears. Now, the Yost are criers. There he is. That's after the interview. And what happened was we did the interview. He was he sat on a on the on the um balcony of the hotel and he just did a crossword puzzle. But afterwards, after the interview, he came, Elwi came into the other room and with Patricia Medina, and all of a sudden, it just really hit him. Oh, my God, I'm standing here with Joseph Cotton, who was in my all-time favorite movie, and he burst into tears again, and then we were all crying, <laughs> and then Joseph Cotton reached into his uh, pocket, pulled out a hanky, he said, here, dear boy, you know, <laughs> wipe those tears. I mean, he didn't know what to it. Here we are, this group of Canadian nut bars standing there crying our eyes out, and he's, he doesn't know what's going on. Graham, I do have to follow up with you on that, because I well remember Elwi's farewell retirement party here at TVO, and you were there as well, and he, yep. he burst out into tears on that occasion as well, and, and it was very unusual for a man of his generation to be that outwardly emotional and have no, just have no embarrassment at all about it. What do you think made him that way? I don't know, but it has cursed me to this day because <laughs> I also will just lose it at the drop of a hat. But, you know, it's funny, my memory of that final, uh, that sort of swan song 25th anniversary party was that he really held it together pretty well. He did get emotional at times, but... He uh, he was. He, there were those times when he could just sort of pull it together and be very clear-eyed and uh, not fall apart. Um, but he, yeah, well, listen, we're we're a weepy. We've always been a weepy family, and uh, you know, it's taken me 62 years to realize if that's going to make me cry, maybe I'm not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm. There might be certain things, Steve, that I'm not going to talk about today. So there <laughs> I, you go. I get you. Okay. Risa, take us back. I, I really want to go back to, to 50 plus years ago because I think if Elwi wasn't the guy who opened the door at TVO, he, I mean, he wasn't far, it wasn't far after the doors got open that he started here. How did he end up starting at TVO in the first place? Okay, so TVO is the merger between the ETV section of the uh, Ministry of Education and a television service called Meta which was, I think, Metropolitan Educational TV Association or something. 
Bill Davis, who was then uh, the Minister of Education, said, why, am I, why are we funding both of these? We should put them together. So that's how the merger started. And in 1970, in September, they went on air for the very first time as Channel 19. I mean, you even had to have a UHF television in order to watch it because mm -hmm. we were on the other dial. And it was a six, eight channel universe. And but he was really, here, Risa. He was here before Saturday Night at the yes. Movies. Yes, he was on staff at because he had been the head of Meta. So they hmm. brought him over, and they he was in corporate, and he decided to start. They wanted to start something called the regional councils, so they would get people from all over Ontario, not necessarily, nobody even could watch us, but they wanted to go to various communities to find out what people wanted, what they needed. Um, so that's how it all started. And Elmi, I said, was up in corporate and these movies came in and they said what to do. And from that point, he left corporate. He went, he came down to the fourth floor, which was the programming floor. I left the fifth floor down to the fourth floor, and that was the that's how it started. And there we go. Very simple. Chris, I'm going to ask you to pick up the story at this point because Elwi not only introduced the movies and and sort of tried to give some context as to what they were about in his own inimitable fashion, but of course the conversations that took place between the movies, where he'd interview. Not necessarily the biggest star in the picture, although he did that too, but often sometimes, you know, the cinematographer or the costume designer or somebody who, who would be a little less famous but who could give you the great stories behind all that. What, in your view, was distinctive about the way that he interviewed those people? I, I think part of it was the fact that he had an encyclopedic memory. And if we were watching a, a, a film together as a family, he'd look at the bartender who was not even in the scene, just back there pouring a drink for someone, and he'd list off the, the six films that he had been in before and playing different roles and parts. So he had this kaleidoscope in his mind of how all the different actors fit together. And then when he talked to a, a, someone who wrote the screenplay or the score, it would all sort of flow together. And I think his, his not just his deep knowledge of film, but his, his absolute, it's a library in his mind. Um, I think that helped a lot. And um, he could ad lib and talk about almost anything with any person uh, that had to do with the movie. Well, Graham, you tell a great story in the documentary about the fact that that he would see a movie and then he would tell you about it after the fact, but he actually would embellish on what he saw, and that actually helped you when you did Speed. Could you talk about that? Right. We, Chris and I called it redirecting, that dad would redirect a movie. And the classic was a Tom Mix or a, a, it was an old Western. And he remembered Tom had been betrayed by bad guys. And he finally makes it back to his horse and he picks up a canteen and lips it to his lips and sand pours out. And he finally saw the movie again. And it was just that it was empty. They hadn't put sand in it, but putting sand in it is a better thing. It's a, it's a crueler beat. So for me, he had told me about a Kurosawa script about a train that couldn't slow down or it would blow up. And that ended up becoming the movie Runaway Train. And the reality is in the, there's no bomb on the train. They just can't get to the brakes. They're going through the frozen tundra of Alaska. And I saw the movie and I came out and I thought, you know, Dad's version is better. It'd be better with a bomb. <laughs> and my addition, addition was to say yeah, it'd be better if it was a bus. Um, and that's that's how, how Speed started, um, was just him having a different take on, on a story he had heard. He hadn't seen the movie. He just heard about it, and he just made it better. Chris, for a guy who spent so much of his life around movies, do you think he regretted the fact that he never actually became a director, became a producer, made that his full-time avocation? I'm, I'm sure that he did regret that, and um, I can remember when he was in his 60s, him saying, I still don't really know what I want to do for a living. <laughs> so he would he would have been happy if he had been able to get into the director's chair. But I think life sort of steered him in a direction where he ended up doing the best thing that he could have done for his personality, I think. Risa, you wanted to add? Absolutely. I wanted to add that one time I had to, oh my goodness, go through hoops 
to try to convince Elway that a movie that he was convinced was in color was actually in black and white. And it took me days. And finally, I had to physically get a copy of the film and show it to him to prove to him it, because he described it and the color was so vivid and fabulous. So like Graham says, he always redirected it and his redirects were much more interesting than the film itself. The other thing that I would like to just point out is that when we talk about how his interview tactics, he could get away with things that nobody would get away with. Like what, for, for instance? Well, for example, some of the women that we interviewed were of an age, and they were very, um, they had spent a little bit of money on their face. <laughs> so they were very concerned about how they would look. And I remember, for example, again, going back to one of Elwi's favorite films, he was so excited when he got to meet Fay Ray. And I had bought him a King Kong tie, and he wore this tie, and she was 87, and she was a little pistol. Oh, my God, because she had been in silent films. She knew how to use her face, and she flirted, and she this and that. And then she sits down with Elwi, and Elwi looks at her with a big smile on his face, and he says, you know... I saw King Kong when I was eight years old and <laughs> the smile would go from, mm, and it, they'd go into this frozen smile, like, <laughs> mm, and, and he would see, he said one time to Jane Wyatt, again, one of his all time favorites, Lost Horizon, he said something and she turned to me and she said, the man is insane. You know you work for a, a crazy man. Because he was going on about how he was 12 and this and that. And again, she's thinking, I'm still that 20-year-old from the movie. Hmm. And Ellie kind of, but he got away with it, which was wonderful. <laughs> I want to ask uh, Chris about, um, you know, after he retired in, I guess it was 1999, um, what did he do with his life at that point? You know, there, there's this weird thing that once you're no longer on TV, somehow you don't exist anymore for so many people who only know you by being on TV. What did he do with his life after he left TVO? Um, for, for a while, he had a show that was similar to uh, Saturday Night at the Movies here on a local station. And then when that finally wound down, he became immersed in, in the, the movies from the 30s. And he'd have... a uh, a big catalog, a thick catalog of, of, in those days, VHS tapes. And his favorite thing would be to go through it and pick out his favorite choices and then order them and wait like a little kid for Christmas until the big box arrived. Then he'd just spend day upon day going through all these beautiful old uh, silent films and, and early 30s movies and uh, mostly, mostly movies from the 30s from his youth. Graham, in your travels in Hollywood, did you ever run into people who said, oh, yeah, he interviewed me 20 years ago for that show he does in Ontario? I, uh, luckily enough, when we were doing a show called Justified in, uh, in Culver City, uh, Mel Brooks had an office upstairs. And we got to know him pretty well. He was a fan of Justified, which was very cool. But he, when he heard my name, he said, I remember your dad. Yeah, he was a great interviewer. That was a lot of fun. Um, so that, that was pretty cool. Um, but, you, you know, listen, you run into any Canadians in, in Hollywood and they say, are you the son of? And hmm. uh, absolutely. And, and it's just so happy that I am. Um, and, you know, there, there is the, the Tarantino story, uh, which was we were at the premiere of Speed and Tarantino was sitting behind us and he had just done Reservoir Dogs. And I said to my wife, that's Quentin Tarantino. And then after a few minutes, his hand came over and he touched dad on the shoulder and he said, are you LBOs? And my dad said, yes. And he said, I've seen every episode of The Movie Makers, um, which was the packaging of all the interviews. And he just went on and on about how much that meant to him. And uh, and then, you know, dad said, well, what are you working on now? And he said, oh, I got a movie coming out next year called Pulp Fiction. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> how did that movie yeah. do anyway? Yeah, I think it did pretty it did well. Okay. Um, I got about a minute left here, and uh, I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative to go back about 29 years to my first ever appearance on this channel. And here's how I got introduced to the viewing public in the province of Ontario. 
Sheldon, if you would. And a new face here in TV Ontario, but certainly no stranger to television viewers in Ontario and in fact to viewers across Canada who know him for his energetic and informative role on CBC and CBC News World. I'm delighted, completely delighted to welcome Steve Pakin to his first appearance on TVO. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's been worth we, waiting for. Ah, we wish you many, many happy decades ahead. I can't tell you guys how meaningful it was to me for Elwios to put his hand on my arm and say, welcome to this place. And I'll never forget that moment, and I'm getting verklempt now just thinking about it. So anyway, that was beautiful. Uh, I want to remind everybody, Magic Shadows, Elwios to Life in Movies airs Saturday night, tomorrow, 8 p.m. Uh, it's available on our website, tvo.org as well, for streaming as you like. And it's been so great to have Graham Yost, Chris Yost, and Risa Schumann with us on the agenda tonight. Take good care, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. See you at the movies. <laughs>
done the initial investigation. Mm -hmm. Have you had any communication with the OPP so far on the issue? Yes, so I reached out to the OPP for a comment and they said that they w it would be inappropriate to provi provide comment at this time because the hearing is still ongoing. But, you know, I did attend um, the hearing on Monday and, you know, the lawyer actually representing the OPP did mention that, like you said, time was of the essence. And, you know, this DNA canvassing was actually crucial, you know, in finding the assailant. And, you know, I think one point that they are trying to make very strongly is that farm workers provided this, you know, of their own volition. You know, they gave consent to provide these samples, so they weren't being forced to in some way. 54, you, you had yeah. mentioned, 54 of the 96 workers who were mm -hmm. swabbed are, are at this hearing. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, about the vulnerability of foreign agricultural workers. Uh, what, what are sort of the obstacles uh, for them to sort of come forward in, in something like this and, you know, repercussions afterwards? Yeah, I think so. These are, you know, se migrant farm workers who are part of a seasonal agricultural worker program. They come from countries in the Caribbean and Mexico. They come to Canada eight to nine months out of the year, you know, season after season. And, you know, I think it kind of, one of the things that experts really brought up for me is that it goes back to that question of consent, right? Look at their immigration status. It's usually tied to their work, to their work their employer so you know it's kind of a they're contractually bound to their employer in that way their employer provides housing you know so there's a level of you know indebtedness or control I think that you know um, migrant workers seem to have with their employer so also some of the vulnerabilities that came out actually were very much highlighted during COVID because if an employer is providing housing reporters were actually finding that some of these housing or these accommodations were not up to par you know they were cramped so these are workers who are living in Canada eight to nine months out of the year there often isn't really a pathway to permanent residency for them and also because of this tied work permit you know they're able the employer is kind of able to fire them at their discretion like the employer is able to say you know I don't want you to return you know next season and, and that's kind of all that they can do and they're repatriated back to their home country. So I feel like there isn't a lot of, you know, the argument here is that there really isn't a lot of flexibility, there isn't a lot of freedom and they don't really have a lot of rights. I am curious about, um, you know, what, what being part of sort of that initial swab actually has, you know, when they go back home. Mm -hmm. Is this something that has been carried on them throughout uh, sort of the last couple of years? You know, I think that um, some of them have actually said that it has. I, you know, I read somewhere that Dwayne um, had actually said that, you know, it has followed him. But what really stuck out to me was there was a witness statement um, submitted as part of the hearing from, you know, actually the lead applicant, his name is Leon Logan. And he mentioned that really that experience really made him feel, feel humiliated and really just made him feel sad. And I think it kind of goes back to that question of agency, right? Of feeling like, yes, you know, I've been asked to do this and I guess I can say no, but can I really say no? I think that that's kind of what he was trying to get at and a lot of the migrant farm workers are trying to get at. Um, is there anyone you spoke to that sort of can help predict if change might come out of this? I know a number of organizations had uh, come up and, and sort of brought this to the forefront. Uh, what are they saying? This is. I, th I believe the first case in Canada like this, mm -hmm. um, where we're talking about migrant workers, is there something going to happen out of this? Yeah, so um, you know, I spoke to um, Shane Martinez, the lawyer, and Chris Ramstrup from Justice for Migrant Workers, and Chris has kind of been advocating on behalf of these workers, you know, for the duration of this process. And I think one of the things that they're pointing out is one, they're just hoping that DNA sweeps like this are not conducted on the basis of race alone, and they're actually kind of maybe also want to bring to light the vulnerabilities or the, u the unique vulnerabilities of these workers who are, you know, when it comes to race and immigration status, a lot of these workers end up, you know, in, you know, rural parts of the province, you know, where they're not, maybe not a lot of people of color or where racial tensions can be a little bit different than they are in like a major city like Toronto. So I think it's really um, important for this organization. What they're doing is really trying to highlight those um, vulnerabilities that the workers face. Well, I know you'll keep a close eye on that and we look forward to seeing that. So thank, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jan. The agenda this week assessed shifting relations between government and labor, asked what Canada needs to do to up its innovation game, and glimpsed some of the complexities around Indigenous identity under the Indian Act and beyond. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with whether there's a crisis in policing in this country. Technically, legally, Police services are supposed to come under civilian control. There's an oversight board, a police services board, that's supposed to uh, be offering direction. Do you think the police chafe at that kind of civilian oversight? I, I don't think it works very well. The oversight doesn't work. The police commissions, the police boards, 
at least in Ontario, and I think it's true across the country, are not very effective. They don't seem to 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 really bring police in line. The example I always give is the the city of Toronto, the the Toronto Police Services Board here. And uh, you know, in 2001, they were told by the Supreme Court of Canada they were strip searching many too many people. Well, they did nothing about it for year after year. They continued to strip more and more and more people until finally there was a government report in 2018 that said, you know, you're strip searching 40% of the people who were arrested when most of the other police forces in Ontario are strip searching 1% of the people arrested. Still, the police board in Toronto said, oh, well, we'll just leave it. It was only last year after the murder of George Floyd that, in fact, the police service board in Toronto said, oh, we're going to change our rules about strip searches. 19 years it took them. Well, that's not a good way for a police board to function. Civilian oversight of the cops, do they resent it? Of course we don't resent it. And, and we also should not diminish the amazing work that John Sewell has done for many years. And John, uh, you and I have a lot in common. I started policing in 1982 in the downtown core in Toronto. So I've seen you at many events. I've seen you certainly at the board. Uh, and I think it's too easy also just to say that this conversation really has only begun since George Floyd. You've been having these conversations with policing and commissions and oversight for many, many years. And we thank you for that. It makes us better. With regards to um, police oversight, and, and you also finalize your actual last paragraph in your book that actually speaks about um, the reality of the role of the police service board, the role of the OIPRD and the SIU and the oversight. There's clear understanding in the regulations, certainly within strategic planning, but also within governance and oversight of police operations. Uh, it worked. It, it's about the uh, uh, honest conversation. Your point, um, we are uh, accountable to our board. Our board is a civilian oversight, which is made up of municipal and provincial and designate people. Um, our board here in Hamilton has seven vibrant participants. Uh, our chair currently is our mayor, and that's uh, uh, until the end of this week coming up. So, uh, no, we do listen and we do not uh, discount the direction from our governor. Uh, Mr. Sewell, sounds like he's killing you with some kindness there. We'll get back to... Uh... We'll get back to some of your feedback on, on those comments from the Hamilton police chief in a second, but I want to bring Nana in here. Uh, we have been talking about the relationship between the police and various minority communities uh, in this and other cities for a very long time now. I think I interviewed John Sewell on his first policing book back in 1985 or something like that. Uh, is there any evidence that you see, Nana, that things are improving in that regard? Well, thank you so much, Steve, for having me. And I'd like to echo the police chief's comments about uh, Mr. Sewell. He has been a huge influence on my activism um, as a baby lawyer. I remember joining the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition and, and just loving that there was an opportunity to engage with like-minded folks. Um, I think in terms of, you know, whether or not it reflects the reality on the ground, at the Black Legal Action Centre, we hear every day from our clients, members of our community who have been overly targeted, scrutinized, overcharged, um, brutalized by violence at the hands of the police. And so we are really concerned that policing often causes more harm to our communities. And I think to answer that question, we need to look at what the statistics tell us. What the stats say is quite important. Police are more likely to stop and search black people. They're more likely to charge our communities and, as compared to white folks. Um, they're more likely to arrest us and more likely to use force against, seriously injure and kill black people. And these are recent statistics. So um, in fact, I don't think that it, is getting better. I think once we look at the statistics, we look at what's going on in the world um, and the impact in our communities, it, it's not getting better. And so something really drastically needs to transform and change. Nana, is that the, the statistics you're referring to, are those post-George Floyd statistics? Because we've certainly heard that there's a massive conversation going on right now, a real zeal for reform is in the air, and that things are changing. True or false? I think it depends on who you ask. What I'm saying is when we speak to our clients, we're hearing that it continues to happen. Those statistics are from the Ontario Human Rights Commission report from 2018 and 2020. And specifically about the use of force and the violence in our community, those are statistics from 2013 to 2017. So, um, you know, what is actually happening on the ground may be very different for some communities, but what we're hearing from our folks is that it's it's continuing to happening. We're still being over-criminalized, over-policed um, and overcharged. So that's what we're hearing on the ground. 
Uh, Jerry Dias, I want to put the same kind of question to you because you as well have been on a bit of a journey as it relates to this premier and this government. Uh, I do remember one time you said this guy's for the rich and he's got a track record of lying and bullying. And oh my goodness, we, we did find some footage, Jerry. We did find some footage. Sheldon, you want to play that footage? You know, Doug, f you. Well, that was then. This is now. You've called the Premier a likable guy, and as I say, you stood beside him at the $15 an hour minimum wage news conference. How has your thinking evolved on this government and this Premier? Well, look. If they do something that I agree with, I say so. If they do something that I disagree with, they certainly hear it in living technicolor, as you just showed. Look, the bottom line is, is we're not in control of who gets elected. I, I agree with a thriving democracy, and that means that the parties that I want to win don't always get elected. But what it also means is that in order to benefit uh, working class people, I'm going to have to meet with the government and push the agenda. So I've been meeting with this government, I've been meeting with Monty, I've been meeting with the Premier, and I've been pushing the agenda. I would like to think the increase to 15, albeit low, was as a result of us pushing. I would like to think about some of the legislation on disconnecting and some of the other things, including skilled trades, is as a result of the labor market, uh, labor movement pushing. So, look, am I madly in love with all of the things that this government is doing? Of course not. Uh, did I support them in the last election? The answer is no. Uh, but ultimately, if they are going to continue to do things and move in the proper direction, then I will give praise where it's due. I would like to think that I'm fairly balanced. But like I said, uh, more times than not, they've heard um, the Fuhrer come out of uniform. And that'll continue until they fix some of the things that I mentioned earlier on. Well, let's actually uh, fact check what you just said right now with the minister. Uh, minister, can you tell us how influential, in fact, the unions represented on this program today and others have been in your thinking to change policy in Ontario? Really influential. I I'm proud of the relationship that many of us have. I mean, uh, again, the first three months I met with over 100 labour leaders, uh, local local labour leaders plus provincial uh, labour leaders. Um, again, where we can find common ground, uh, let's work together and, and build upon that. Uh, and Jerry's right, we moved to $15 an hour after meeting with uh, labour leaders, and we're moving to about $15.50 an hour come October. So it is a beginning. There's lots of work we're going to continue to do uh, together. Fred, I am curious as to what went through your head when you no doubt watched that news conference of the government unveiling its move to $15 an hour for minimum wage, and you saw the head of Unifor there, the head of OPSU there, Smokey Thomas, uh, I know there have been other news conferences where uh, Joe Mancinelli, the head of Leona, uh, was there as well. Uh, what goes through your mind when you see these labor leaders um, standing beside the premier, the finance minister, Minister McNaughton and others? Well, while that was taking place, I was actually at the Ontario Federation of Labor Convention, where over a thousand delegates from every affiliated union uh, actually debated an emergency resolution that said we saw right through what was happening here. Let's talk about this $15 an hour minimum wage. It's like somebody stole your car three years ago and they're giving it back to you, although it's got way more kilometers on it and a few dents and scratches. You know, more than $5,000 was ripped out of the pockets of low wage workers when this government, upon being elected three years ago, reversed uh, a plan change to the minimum wage. They, you know, they dragged workers backwards, and we still aren't back to where we would have been in 2018. I suspect what I'm about to read is going to be like waving a red flag in front of a bull here, but I'm going to read something that's a bit uh, in your face from Tobias Lutke, the German-born Canadian billionaire, founder and CEO of Shopify, and here's what he had to say about Canada's culture of competitiveness and some of the issues that we've been talking about already here this evening. It's just unfortunate truth that Canada is at best a go-for-bronze society, just in terms of its ambitiousness. This is why these amazing companies are being created and then sell way too early, usually to American investors. I want to find the best Canadians I can and tell everyone we are allowed to go for gold try to build a world-beating company. I'd like to know, Leah, why don't you start us off with this? Is he right that we seem to have a, 
We certainly don't have it in the Olympics anymore. We have an own-the-podium approach for the Olympics. But when it comes to innovation, are we still a go-for-bronze nation? I don't know who is the go-for-bronze nation. The entrepreneurs I work with every day want to stay here. They want to build their companies. They want to build them to scale. So I think that we have the potential to be a go-for-gold. I think the challenge is that we sit around talking about this like it's esoteric and that we don't have any great examples of companies that could scale. And we do. I just don't think they get the limelight. They don't get the, the you know, the um, they don't have the lobbying might. They don't have agency to use the, the technical term. But and, and so, how do you understand who those companies are? How do you raise them up? I mean, I can see companies in regenerative ag. I can see companies in water. I can see companies in uh, digitally enabled clean tech as we apply AI to super energy. You know, apply super energy efficiency to mining, for example. You know, these are all things that I think Canada can lead in globally, and I think it's a question of how do we decide to um, support those gold for gold companies, and how do we, um, you know, really identify them and help put the right supports around them. And I think that's something that Dan really speaks to is that we haven't thought about it of getting to scale. We haven't thought about the fact that we need to have thousands of deployments of technologies or products. Um, to be able to then get into the other stages of innovation. And, and by focusing on novelty and single entrepreneurs and VC-backed, we miss this whole understanding of what gold for gold really means. Huda, can I get your view on that? Do you think you're part of a go for bronze ecosystem? Um, I don't, just for the record, I don't agree with most of what Toby says, but this one I do agree with him on. I do think there's a culture of mediocrity in Canada and in the innovation ecosystem in general. But I find it very funny that he's saying this because when they listed, they picked like all American bankers. So I think it's a little bit contradictory that he's saying this. Um, I do think, I do think Canada, yeah, has a culture of mediocrity for sure. And the companies have to fight uphill battles in order to become those Sort of, you know, we, Dot Health has global aspirations for sure. We do believe we'll be headquartered in Canada and, you know, kind of build for the rest of the world. There's lots of companies that do that. Um, but it is a lot more difficult than if you're surrounded by a mindset of winning, you know, at all costs. Again, that that, that comes with its own set of problems. But um, it, there's definitely this yeah, this this, uh, this culture of mediocrity that I've definitely experienced um, here. Ty, maybe you could follow up on that because one of the things, and I think it's been referenced already in our conversation, one of the things we hear about Canada that makes it such a difficult place to go for gold is that we, we can't scale up the way that others in other countries can. Why is that? So we can scale up the way uh, uh, entrepreneurs in other countries can. It's not a matter of can or can't you. Uh, we absolutely can. But it's more difficult. I think, you know, the reality is at policy level, we, we touched on this a little while ago, is the battle, you know, 10, 15 years ago is how do we move ideas out of the research uh, bench in, into startups? And while it's not perfect yet, we need to do better, we can do that. Today's battle is, you know, how do we scale these companies? How do we lead them? How do we finance them? How do we market and sell them? We can absolutely do that. But a lot of the people at the policy level are fighting just like a general fights the last battle. For years, you tried to get status as a member of the Algonquin of Pickwakanagan First Nation. How come or how did you come not to have that status in the first place? So I inherited uh, sex discrimination. It was an intergenerational uh, inheritance. My great grandmother was removed from uh, Pickwakanagan in the 30s with her children, my, my grandmother being one of them, because of issues um, around sex discrimination. Because her lineage, her lineage came through. Um, well, her husband, his lineage came through. Oh, terrible, through his mother line. So his name was Joseph Gagne, and my great-grandmother was Annie Jane Maness. They were both Indigenous from Pickwaknagan, and they were removed because of issues of sex discrimination in the Indian Act. Well, in fact, you shared a letter that your great-grandmother received in January of 1945, and we're going to put a photo up of it right now, and it reads, Dear Madam, I am in receipt of a copy of your letter recently sent to the Indian Affairs Branch, Ottawa, with regard to your status as an Indian. In reply, I wish to inform you that you are not an Indian, as defined by the Indian Act. At the time of your marriage to Joseph Gagnon, a white man, any rights you had as an Indian of the Golden Lake Band ceased, and you became a white woman. And then, pathetically, it's signed yours very truly, H.P. Ruddy, 
Indian agent. Just talk about the impact that a letter like that would have had on your great-grandmother. I never had the opportunity to meet my great-grandmother. I know that I, when I received it in the mail from an archivist, it, it floored me, like r really floored me. I'm, I'm happy that you read it and you didn't ask me to read it because it's, it's a pretty emotional letter. But what's interesting, or I guess not interesting, what it, what it uh, demonstrates is that men don't lose their status if they, quote-unquote, marry out, but women do. Have I got that right? Well, that was prior, uh, you know, prior to 1985, that was the case. And now um, you, you, don't la you don't lose status or gain status uh, through marriage. They changed that in 1985. And then they also, of course, incorporated new forms of sex discrimination in the Indian Act in 1985. Uh, talk about that. What does that mean? Sure. So in terms of Gale versus Canada, I'll just limit my discussion to there. So prior to 1985, they had a, a I'm going to call it a wonderful provision that protected children of unknown and unstated paternity. Um, when the father, when the man or the father wasn't known, the child was a, a status Indian like the mother. But in 1985, what they did is they secretly took that out and became the, uh, the Indian Act became silent on that very matter. And then at the level of policy and practice within the Department of Indian Affairs, they were harming those children. They were they were ruling or making decisions that, in, in essence, um, meant the man was a white man, and then these children were being denied um, their Indian status registration. So that's that's what happened in 1985. There's other forms of sex discrimination that were created as well. But um, you know what's really disturbing about that situation is it's often said that the Indian Act was amended in 1985 to bring it in line with the Charter, and it just completely failed to do that and actually what happened was the legislative change opportunity became um, an opportunity to create new forms of sex discrimination which is horrific. Zeldin, blood quantum, what is that? Uh, it's a really insidious form of uh, constructing an arbitrary cutoff on who's Indigenous and who's not. So for the longest time, and, and even there's sort of in a de facto way, the Indian Act has a blood quantum. It doesn't come out and explicitly say it. So basically it is a, a quantum. It's a quantum measurement of, of blood. It could be expressed in percentages or fractions, so degrees of being mixed. In the Indian Act, uh, as it currently stands from the amendment in 1985, is if you mix and you know, it's a it's a larger discussion too, but there is a calculus behind it. If you mix too many times, and what we understand now being the second generation cutoff, it, you know, so if you have like a status Indian who mixes, two, there's two generations of mixing with non-status. That's the end of it for status itself. But um, you know, you'll you'll hear sort of turns of phrases of being a, I'm a full-blooded Indian or I'm half or. They may be off the cuff themselves, but when they're worked into citizenship codes and membership, or at least the uh, the statutes and the laws that are imposed upon us by the state, it's very insidious. It's uh, what you might call, and it's used another turn of phrase amongst ourselves, arithmetic genocide, is that it just basically creates the terminal end of when you've breeded yourself out of existence. Catherine, what's your view on it? Yeah, I agree. Um, like, in order to continue exi to exist as peoples, you need a bunch of things. You need territory, you need culture, you need language, but first and foremost, you need people. And uh, the Indian Act status regime uh, is systematically and methodically and intentionally reduces the number of people down to nothing in some cases. So um, I, you know, as I, I said earlier, I don't want to make either my own citizenship, my children's citizenship, or, or uh, my, my nation's ability to claim us subject to that. And the path, of course, is for, um, is for nations to reclaim jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction about how they define citizenship, you know, and the, the rights and obligations that, that come from citizenship. And it'll be different. Like I, I know with Haudenosaunee, territory, uh, Haudenosaunee nations and the citizenship uh, regimes around there, they're very different than than what I think the Shikwekmik citizenship um, system and law and jurisdiction, how that would be exercised. And that says it should be. We are different people. We have different laws. Gahande, I, I suspect there are many mm -hmm. white people watching us right now. 
who assume that there are great benefits to having a status card. And I wonder if you could weigh in on that and tell, if, tell us if that is in fact the case. It's just a card. <laughs> many people think that, <laughs> many people think that, uh, you know, the card gives you great benefits in terms of tax uh, reductions and whatnot. It, it really doesn't. Like anybody else, I pay taxes. I work here in Ottawa at Carleton University. Uh, that card really doesn't help me in terms of reducing, uh, you know, purchase price on items and things like that. Um, and and to me, that tax card is a, is a symbol of, um, of of colonial occupation. It's a symbol of the oppression of our people, and we are forced to take that. We are forced to to apply for these cards and prove who we are in in that system, in that other system. Um, but it really doesn't do very much, and, and it seems to weigh, have a lot of weight in terms of uh, non-indigenous uh, eyes and those who, who co covet them. That is some of what we considered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can always visit our website, that's tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, November 26th, 2021. Monday on the program, neuroscientist Wendy Suzuki explains how that everyday anxiety you're coping with could actually be put to good use. I'm Steve Paik, and thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. On behalf of NAM, have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you back here on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Paikin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.